Here we've got a Hacker GP42. This is a push-pull amplifier, which isn't ultra-linear. It's using the triopentode two-stage valves, which are the ECL86 type. The Hacker and Dynatron company were a lot better in terms of quality. They used much better components, screening and grounding, twisted pair wiring throughout their record players, connectors all joining up so you could easily get inside there and service and repair. The loudspeaker was a Goodman's elliptical, the 13 and a half by 8 inch type. Here you can see pre-service with the old capacitors and we replaced them with new capacitor types and did a full service. The amplifier came alive and went into full volume, 10 watts with a low distortion and a good full power and great tone and sound. The Hacker GP42 circuit is a push-pull design but not ultra-linear. Unlike the Danset Hi-Fi Mark I, Mark II and the Dynatron Mazurka type, the Bush SRP series is also a push-pull amplifier which isn't ultra-linear. Here you can see AC wiring is used throughout on the Hacker GP42 series. Just a much better quality build. You've got AC twisted pair for the high power and the low tension and also for the audio signals or if they're not screened they will be twisted pair throughout. The best model I could find was the actual GP45 series which is a transistor type amplifier. This one is from the early 1970s and it uses a Garrard 3000 series record deck. That was a, a way superior sounding record player, overkill when you think of it because there was a lot of resonance between the loudspeaker and the cartridge due to the high volume and very good bass response. It's overkill because you have a loudspeaker built inside the same cabinet where you've got the cartridge and stylus so you'll get a resonance for that reason. If you use an external loudspeaker then that will be okay of course, you won't get that problem so much. With the Danset Hi-Fi model, I find with the grey high flux type loudspeakers, there's always a good reliability and a good sound quality. I don't have so much respect for the ELAC, they often sound very poor, along with the Celestian type that we often find inside the Danset Hi-Fi. I would go for the grey non-branded type, which are the high flux and uh, mentioned in the service manual but um, I don't know which manufacturer that is. The Goodman's of course is also another very good company for the record players. It makes a big difference if you've got a poor loudspeaker inside the record player but a very good amplifier and very good valves makes um, a very big difference. On the Bush SRP series the loudspeaker inside is a big letdown. It's uh, very cramped for space and you do not find enough room in the rear to fit anything decent inside there. Otherwise the record player is a very good record player. The uh, ECL86 series valves are also found inside the Armstrong Hi-Fi amplifier, the twin stereotype one here that you see. On the back of the GP42 and the GP15 series you can see input connectors and output connectors. These are for the cartridge output or for the loudspeaker output or you have an input where you can run a radio or a guitar etc. The only true line output device I could find would be the actual Bush SRP amplifier and that gives you a tertiary winding where you can actually get a line level output. All the other record player models I found you do not get a true line output. You get an external loudspeaker output which is way overpowered for your line level. Later on in part two we're going to go through the voltage checkpoints and we've got 1 to 15 here and we're going to go through the actual amplifier with an AVO meter and Phil will show you around and show you how to do a service checkpoint over an amplifier. Right now here's Phil Moss with the circuit diagram of the GP42 Hacker record player. Right, Hacker GP42. As I think I've said before, I'm quite an admirer of Hacker, a good British company, which is why they've gone bust. Their stuff was too good. They did like to run their transformers burningly hot to the hand, but funnily enough, they didn't burn out. So one can't really criticise them that much. Not as famous as the Danset. Um, I suppose these were rather more expensive, but they were much better. 
And I suspect that nowadays they fetch less money than the Dan set, even though they're a better buy second hand. Anyway, starting with the circuit. Okay, we've got an input from a crystal or ceramic um, pickup. They have the facility for stereo. Now the actual player is mono, but as with quite a few of these later record players, they gave you a facility to plug an external amplifier in for the other channel. They also tended to give you a recording output, hence we've got the sockets on the back as it were. So the signal comes in for the internal amplifier down here. There is a small tone correction circuit here, the capacitor in parallel with the resistor. It then feeds into the volume control. We then have the treble control, and as with many of these, it's a treble cut control, but with a bit of boost up there, in the middle position, it was probably about flat. As with these simple ones, what is happening here, you have a capacitor in the earthy end of the treble control, which short circuits your treble. However, it's a high impedance to mid and bass, so wherever you adjust this pot, it makes very little difference to the bass and middle um, levels, which are therefore fed through to that capacitor into the first triode. There are two triode pentodes in here, ECL86s. So they're high gain amplifiers, which allows negative feedback to be applied over it to improve the distortion. This has a 2.2 mega ohm uh, grid bias resistor, so it's a self-biasing valve using the electrons that hit the control grid to drive the control grid negative with respect to ground, although, funnily enough, it has conventional bias as well. So most of the bias voltage on this triode will actually be developed by the 2.2K resistor there. Decoupled by a 50 microfarad, which I see is marked with an M, not a mu, and therefore strictly is a millifarad, but um, they couldn't be bothered to use the correct symbol. And then we've got the 100 ohms there to develop the feedback across. The feedback has the base control in it. If you turn this up to the full 50k, then the feedback is all at treble and middle frequencies through the capacitors. But as you short circuit that out, the base gets through. That will always pass the higher frequencies. This blocks the lower frequencies unless you short it out, and hence it affects the base, not the middle and treble. The output from the first anode is fed via that capacitor to the grid of one of the output valves. The grid leak does not go to earth, nor does the grid leak of the other output pentode. They are joined together and to the grid of the second triode, and then there's another one meg to earth. The small difference voltage generated across those resistors is fed to this grid with a gain which is exactly the opposite of that. So if that, for instance, was times 100, you'd want this signal here to be divided by 100. The valve then inverts its phase. So this grid is driven 180 degrees out of phase with this. I'll put it another way, if that's positive, that's going to be negative. Fed into this output valve, they have separate bias resistors as they're supposed to have and decoupling capacitors. Now the valves are run pentode, not ultralinear. They are fed from a resistively smooth power supply using that 200 ohm resistor there. The screen grids are further decoupled by this 16 microfarad capacitor and the 1.5K. There is then a 10K resistor and another capacitor here, which I think is eight microfarads, and that feeds the two input valves. There you are, the anode load of that one and the anode load of that one. Both 220K, so they're being run for quite a lot of gain in those triodes. Something interesting. It has an internal speaker and will normally only be used with an internal speaker, but it does have the facility to connect an external one. Now, if we look at the secondary of the transformer, there are two windings. So this can actually drive two different output impedances. 
Now, it's not at all clear to me why they have done that. When run with the internal speaker, they knew what the impedance was going to be, so why give you a choice? One possibility is that when you put an external one in parallel with it, that one changes the output impedance to be lower. But there is no switching arrangement. What they might have done is have a switch which was automatically operated when you plugged in the external speaker and connected these two windings in parallel instead of series. But they haven't done it. So it appears that they have an unnecessarily complex winding. It costs money to bring the ends of the windings out. Um, it also introduces more leakage inductance, although on the secondary that isn't very important. The importance of leakage inductance, as I say often, is that it causes a phase shift and causes instability, which brings us to the other part of the feedback loop, 4K7 with a small capacitor 330PF across it. That's the phase correction capacitor primarily to correct the phase shift in the output transformer and to keep the circuit stable. And that would also apply to the reason that they have put a 330PF across the first anode load resistor. Going to the power supply, something that is a little unusual for record player, they have taken the trouble to centre tap the heater supply. They haven't um, centre tap the winding itself, they have used two resistors across it, which is much the same thing. Now that's not normally done in record players, but by balancing the heater supply to earth, they get a lower hum figure. That could have been made a variable and adjusted for minimum, but that really is asking a lot for a record player. They have provided a separate heater winding for the rectifier valve. Now that rectifier valve, I suspect, although it doesn't appear to be marked as an EZ80, and the EZ80, and I've said this before as well, was intended for use on a common heater supply, but it is still good practice to have a separate one should the heater cathode insulation fail. So again, they have added a little bit of extra cost to this unit, which you don't get on the cheaper ones. I can see also that there's an electrostatic shield between primary and secondaries on this mains transformer shown there as earthed. It also has a three pin mains connection with an earth chassis, safer, and also you tend to get less hum buzz and extraneous noise if you earth the chassis. It's an AC only unit, obviously with a transformer. It's got a motor there and they have earthed the body of the uh, motor as well. That is shown specifically on the drawing. There is the switch for the turntable. The main main switch is double pole on this unit. We're moving into a more modern era where switching one only is not done, and particularly switching the neutral deliberately instead of the live isn't done. And it does have a mains fuse, which again wasn't done on previous generations of most um, electrical equipment that for domestic use and was really not very appropriate. Up here, surprise, surprise, we have the taps for mains voltages between 205, so 200 to 210. Um, and then we've got the higher voltages there, that's 240 to 250, basically. And we have a dial light to tell you it's on if you can't hear it. And that, I think, is enough for the GP42.